All right. Welcome, everyone. Wow, we have a lot of people in here already. <laughs> Shocking. <laughs> yes, this is this is the safe place where we learn how to train and eat our dogs better. So very on point. Welcome, Dr. Judy Morgan. Thank you for here today to talk about what's going on with Purina Pet Food, if anything at all. Welcome, welcome. So, yeah, I know. So, I'm going to put a big disclaimer on this because I know that Perina is watching. Dr. Judy, I don't know if I told you this, but they're in my comments now. So, I know they're watching. So, I'm going to start this with a disclaimer that we are not going to, con- we're not confirming that there is a recall or anything wrong. There is no Purina recall. Food. Yeah, there's no recall, nothing as of right now, January 8th, 12 p.m. PST. That could change. But right now, all we're going to do is talk about what's going on based on the consumer reports that we have seen. And that is it. We're not making any claims. We're not brand bashing per se. So um, Perina, if you're watching, we're just sharing what we've seen and what is publicly available. Hello. Yes, they are definitely here. So that said, Dr. Judy, let's just jump into it. Let's talk about, you know, for those watching, I pulled up this news article from, I think it's like E-Tales or something. Um, This is what we're seeing starting to pop up on headlines. We're seeing it on social media where consumers or pet parents are alleging that their pets are becoming sick with diarrhea, lethargy, vomiting, et cetera, after eating a specific brand of food. Dating is back as early as back as June, but more recently it's been become prevalent in December. Um, and then where a lot of these claims have come from, just to give some background for those who are just new to this, have come from this awesome Facebook group. Um, run by Kelly. Her, it's a picture of her dog and it's called Saving Pets One at a Time. I highly recommend anybody watching this to go check out this Facebook group. Um, and we'll talk more about it later on. But this Facebook group was actually dedicated to her dog who passed away from, um, what was it? She Her dog was- Her dog was on a Hills uh, pet food that had too much vitamin D in it. And her dog died one week before the recall occurred. Right. And so, so she has dedicated her life to making sure that this doesn't happen to other dogs and cats. And that's why it's called saving pets one at a time. Yes. Yeah, so definitely check it out. You'll see a lot of the consumer reports there where a lot of those, that's where we're getting a lot of information from. So Dr. Judy, jumping right into it, um, what is going on from your perspective with Perina to the best of your knowledge? Well, so I have dedicated (laughs) most of my holistic veterinary career to food because I am a TCBM food therapist. And so I actually use food as medicine. So food is critically important to me for our animals. And in wanting to know more about the pet food industry. I became friends with Susan Thixton at Truth About Pet Food, and she invited me to start going to AFCO meetings. And going to an AFCO meeting, which is the Association of Feed Control Officials, is one of the most eye-opening things you can ever do. Because And it's expensive, and there's very few if any, consumers there. Uh, It's uh, regulatory officials from states and from federal agencies. And um, basically, it's all about what can be approved. To AFCO is not a regulatory agency. They are an agency that kind of sets the guidelines for what can and cannot be used in pet food. And once your eyes are open to the ingredients that are allowed to be used and the ingredients that are being used, you cannot close your eyes to that again. And <clears throat> so one of the, the keynote speeches that ever occurred at an AFCO meeting was given by the head of DARPRO rendering. And in that keynote speech, he said, it is virtually impossible to have a rendered ingredient in pet food that does not contain euthanasia solution, pentobarbital. And all these regulatory officials in the room are shaking their head going, mm-hmm, yeah, we know that. And we have, there have been many tests of pet food going back to the 1990s where they have, sh- and it's, it's come up recently in other pet foods over the past few years. 
And there's not even recalls on it unless there's enough. So there was the one with Evangers, and there was a lawsuit, and the pet owner won. Her dogs died. One of her dogs died, and they all got sick from euthanasia solution in their canned pet food. We know it's there. FDA knows it's there. And they refuse to act on it because they said it's not in a large enough quantity to cause harm. I'm sorry. Euthanasia solution at all does not belong in our pet food. And that is just one of hundreds of things that we can find that are wrong in pet food. So when we start seeing trends, when we start seeing a lot of reports of a problem, a lot of pets being ill with similar symptoms, we start to scratch our head and say, wow, does all this lead back to a starting point? And that is how that's how studies are done. That is how recalls come about. You start to see a trend. So let's look back at 2007. Animals started to have more, or veterinarians started to see more kidney failure cases. Animals were, more animals were dying from kidney failure. Somewhere along the way, a couple of people got together and started talking and said, hey, are you seeing more kidney disease? Hey, are you having to euthanize more animals with kidney disease? Hey, are you getting a lot more dead animals pre presented to your clinic? What's the common denominator? And you know what we found out? Melamine. Melamine being added to pet food was causing kidney disease, was causing kidney failure, and was killing animals. Where do you think all of that started? And guess what? We didn't have social media, so we couldn't blow it up as fast at that point. But it started from people talking and saying, I see a trend. How did the vitamin D recall come about? Hmm. A bunch of veterinarians started seeing a trend. Wow, we're getting a lot more kidney failure. We're seeing a lot more dead animals. We have a lot more dying animals. There seems to be a problem. We have animals backing away from their food. Somebody got smart, people started to talk and they started putting their heads together. And what did we end up? We ended up with an international pet food recall across dozens of companies because they were all using the same vitamin mineral mix. So I'm not saying that we know what's causing the problem right now. We don't. All I'm saying is, Kelly was actually the first person, but somebody started to see a trend. And so now when you see a trend and your pet died from tainted pet food, are you the person who sits back and goes, well, I'm just going to watch all these animals die. All these people are telling me their animals have died. Are you that person who sits back or are you that person who says, I'm dedicating my life to not letting one more pet die like my pet did? I better alert some people that I'm getting an awful lot of reports that are very similar. And that's where we are with this. Do we have proof? that the food is toxic. Nope. But <laughs> there's a lot of samples of pet food going out for testing right now. And when we get those results, we are going to be happy to share them. So that's where we are. I'm collecting veterinary reports. I'm collecting veterinary data. I am getting ultrasound results and lab results and veterinary records. And then we have a team of veterinarians who are going to look at them. One is actually a nutritionist like a board certified nutritionist, because I know everybody thinks I'm a quack and I don't know what I'm talking about. And that's fine. You can think that it doesn't really bother me. But we have a team and we are looking because I don't want to see one more animal die. When you have a family like the family with the pugs that died from eating the Avengers and you have multiple animals in the family all getting sick at the same time, you open a new bag of food and either they refuse to eat it or they all develop bloody vomiting and diarrhea, what's the common denominator? If you take them to the veterinarian and they rule out infectious disease, okay, they don't all have parvo. They don't all have, you know, some, oh, well, we don't know if it's a bacterial infection in the bowel because we don't know what's coming from the food, but there's a common denominator there. Yeah. You, you have to investigate. Yes. And that's been really tough. So I started sharing sharing about what's been going on. In fact, let me show this real quick. Um, so in the Facebook group where, as you mentioned, and we mentioned earlier, where Kelly, the admin of this Facebook group, 
here's the graphic here, where she started getting a lot of reports of pet parents claiming their pets were sick after feeding um, Purina. The latest reports, um, I have a screenshot here. Again, this is from the Saving Pets One at a Time Facebook group. Um, again, this is not, we're not claiming, Dr. Judy and I are not claiming that there are this many d- cats and dogs sick or unalived from this food, but these are the number of reports, 565 dogs and cats, um, are sick and pet parents are concerned it might be tied to the food and they're all eating foods that are listed on the screen, one of the the Purina foods. And so I think what's been hard for, for me uh, and a lot of people out there, Dr. Jude, and your point of do we share about this or do we stay quiet is that then we start getting a lot of lash back, right? Like, oh, well, there, there's no, there's no, you know, the, there's no proof. Like, how do you know you're just brand bashing? And, but what I find interesting is you talk about melamine and I was looking at, um, the office of inspector general evaluation report, which is on truth about petfood.com. Susan Thixton, please. I've talked about her a lot, but, um, go check that out. And quote says that according to the FDA, they received 18,000 consumer complaints from March through May 2007 regarding melamine contaminated pet food that was causing illness and death among pets. And so I think to kind of summarize and reiterate what you were saying and why I'm sharing this, I know I'm going to get a lot of comments like, why are you sharing this, Rachel? You're blowing this out of proportion is because we can't, we can't stay quiet. We're not, we don't know what's going on, but something's going on. So we're just at minimum. And Dr. Judy, we talked about this before. I think our goal is just to spread awareness, not even to say you have to stop feeding Purina right this second, because that's not an option for everybody in this moment, but more of letting pet parents know there's something going on. Be aware if your pet has symptoms or clinical signs, they should see a veterinarian. Is that a good way to summarize it, Dr. Judy? Exactly. So, you know, a lot of the backlash we've gotten, I've been feeding these products for the past 16 years, 20 years, 30 years, take your pick. I've never had a problem. That is amazing. That is awesome. That's great. And that speaks to uh, the quality that the food can be and has been at different times. Um, That doesn't mean there's not a problem now. And I mean, again, with the melamine, with the vitamin D, with salmonella, with the the huge Midwest Pet Foods uh, aflatoxin recall that we had this past year, these recalls happen after we start noticing a trend. And I don't wanna see one animal sickened or dying from something they ate. And I, I cannot not bring it to people's attention in good conscience. The only way I can sleep at night is knowing that I told people, hey, be on the lookout. If you're feeding this and it's been working well, that's great. If you buy, you and sooner or later, you're going to run out of the bag you're feeding right now. Yeah. If you buy a new bag and your animal backs away from it and says, I don't want to eat it, that's a sign. Don't force them to eat it. If they have vomiting or diarrhea on the new product, that's a sign. Save a sample, save the lot number, stick it in your freezer in a sealed container, keep it until we know what's going on. But don't put yourself in a position where you're standing in the emergency veterinary service on Saturday night with an animal with bloody vomiting and diarrhea and dehydration and potentially a death sentence and a $7,000 bill. Like, if if you see something, you have to say something. I mean, that's something we all, we've all been told yeah. <laughs> for the past, you know, 20 years. So let's, here's another example. Pro-heart injection mm-hmm. for heartworm prevention. When it originally came out, oh God, I wish I could remember the year, um, but it was probably 20 years ago. Uh, when it originally came out, everybody thought, this is great. I don't have to give a heartworm pill once a month because, you know, that's so inconvenient. I can just go twice a year and get this injection and it'll solve the problem. Well, enough animals had bad reactions or died that it actually got the FDA's attention and actually got pulled off the market. But how many dogs had to get sick? How many dogs had to die? How many veterinarians had to report that before it got pulled off the market? And by the way, it was only off for a couple of years and it came back even bigger and better. Now you can get the super duper 12 month shot, which is even more deadly. So, but that's another conversation for another day. So 
I actually want to, I'm going to show my age here because nobody in my office knew what I was talking about. <laughs> Rachel was like, what? Yeah. So, I'm here to learn. <laughs> yeah. When we talk about bad crap that happens that people didn't predict or didn't know about, and we had to wait for enough problems to occur in order for somebody to scratch their head and say, oh, geez, what's the common denominator? So for those of you who are in my age category, you might remember back in the 1950s and 1960s, there was a drug called thalidomide, and it was used to relieve morning sickness and was given to hundreds of thousands of pregnant women. So over 100,000 babies were affected, the babies were born blind, deaf, with shortened or no limbs, and internal organ damage. And we had to have 100,000 fetuses injured before somebody was able to put things together and say, oh, we think we have a problem. Here's another one. You know, because big pharma is really no different than pet food. It's like it's a money making process, folks. Uh, doctors knew in 1973 that the epilepsy drug sodium valproate posed a risk to unborn children and ordered warnings to be moved from the packets. Now, why would you remove a warning if you know there's a problem? Almost 50 years and 20,000 disabled babies later, it's still being prescribed to pregnant women. You know, see something, say something. I'm sorry, I can't, I, I can't yeah. not say it. Um, do you want, do you want to talk about the period of response? Yeah. So, well, I was actually going to say that, cause you mentioned the FDA earlier, I pulled this screenshot from Susan Thixton's truth about pet food. I just put her link in the chat as well and linked in the description, but from her, from the fourth, she actually reached out to the FDA. Again, she is a consumer yes. pet food advo advocate. She attends the AFCO meetings uh, with Dr. Judy and team and I just want to make this clear that FDA did respond and say they are aware of reports of pet, illness, pet illnesses and in the process of evaluating the reports. So yes. that I think is good in that, um, you know, there's at least awareness kind of early on. Like we're, I think we're definitely making waves um, with this. Right. And, and we, we th th this is, you know, part of the, the process that yeah. we need pet owners. Now it is estimated that adverse event adverse events to anything, a drug being given, a vaccine being given, a food causing a problem, even human foodborne illnesses. If it's not reported, because you see reports all the time of people coming down with salmonella, being hospitalized, some people dying from fruits and vegetables. And so we also see recalls for salmonella, E. coli, listeria in pet food quite often. Yeah. But it, you know, there's no way that the, because t lab testing of pet food as far as contaminants, which really they only test for bacterial contamination, um, is done at the state level. There's no way that 50 state officials are going to walk into pet stores and sample every single brand and every single uh, sub you know, like recipe Purina formula. Probably makes, yeah, yeah. Purina probably makes 2000 recipes. Right. So, you know, there's no way that all those get tested. And, and some, I saw somebody said, oh, but doesn't Purina do independent testing? Nope. There are very, very few pet food companies who test their products for uh, vitamin mineral composition or um, uh, contaminate, you know, bacterial contaminants. Very few companies do that. And they certainly don't do it. Well, there's a couple, very few do it on every batch. batch. So th there is, there is no way for us to know there's a problem until enough people start reporting that there is a problem because they're not doing that testing. And so when, if you have, and that was one of the things uh, I saw somebody posted, it was probably a Purina person who said, oh, we have, you know, 600 nutritionists on staff and uh, we have, we institute 60,000 um, uh, quality safety measures every single day. Cause I mean, I don't know how many plants they have, but there's a lot. And this goes for any big pet food company, but if they say they're putting in 60,000 safety measures every day, then show me the testing, show me the testing on every batch that comes out of every recipe or formula in your brand every day. 
Show me that testing because I have yet to see it. It is not available. It is not posted on their websites. So, I mean, there are a lot of supplements, like particularly for like things like CBD. They produce a certificate of analysis on every single batch, if they're a good company, on every single batch that is produced. So where's that COA for every batch of pet food saying, hey, we tested it. There's no bacterial contamination. There's no aflatoxin contamination. And I can tell you why it's not done because I'm sending out a bunch of food to be tested. And you know how much it costs? $1,000 per sample. Per sample. So I'm sending out four samples, but you know, if this goes on for too long, I'm going to go broke testing. It's okay. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I decided I'm going to stand on this little stump right now. <laughs> and we, and we thank you for it because I, it's t I mean, you've been getting the hate mail and the negative well, comments. And this is and the thing. So we think a pet owner sent your food in for testing. Well, how many pet owners that just had a huge veterinary bill now want to spend a thousand dollars you know, unless you really believe it is your food and you have the money to do it and you want to hold somebody accountable. But yeah. it is, I will tell everybody that no matter which pet food company we're talking about, it is much less expensive for them to pay vet bills on a couple thousand animals because on, less than 1% of adverse events are reported. So it is much less expensive to pay veterinary bills on a couple thousand animals than it is to do a major recall. So and, you know, even a class action lawsuit, look what happened with Hills with the vitamin D, $12.5 million. You split that between all those pet owners, they got about 75 bucks. And so the problem is, if you have a pet who is made ill and you reach out to the pet food company and you say, I believe your food made my pet ill. Here's my veterinary records. Here's my veterinary bills. And the pet food company says, okay, it was $2,000. Here, we're going to write you a check for $2,000, but in order to get that, you have to sign a non-disclosure agreement so that if we go to a class action lawsuit, then you can't be a part of it. And if we go to a class action lawsuit or there is a problem found, you cannot post on social media, tell your friends or anyone else. And now, if you're the pet owner who just had five cats die and it was $4,600 at the veterinary office. You want your $4,600 back. You can't get your cats back either way. So do you want to help save other pets or do you just want to cut your losses and run? Because if it goes to a class action lawsuit, you might see $25 five years from now. Yeah. I mean, I, it's, it's a hard place for yeah. pet owners to be in. I get it. I understand it. But if we don't have people who are willing to, and I'm not, this is not against a a specific pet food company. I'm just telling you how recalls work, how any problem with any drug, any pet food, any vaccine, any anything, this is this is the process. And so, you know, and so it is what it is. <laughs> so okay, so let's let's back up actually real quick before we go through the uh statement from Perina, which we will go through because we do want to be as fair as possible. And I do want to spend a couple minutes at the end talking about what kind of pet food do you like, which I already know the answer. Um, but I want to talk a second about, okay, I'm that pet parent, let's say, hypothetically, my dog is sick or my cat, because this is potentially impacting cats. Oh, yeah. No. Um, yeah. And I think it's the food. So my, you know, you kind of went over it, but basically if they have clinical signs or symptoms, we, we go to the vet. What do I do from, from there? My, my understanding is that we go to the Facebook group that they have like list of like where they can go and send the food in for testing. If we want to go that route, um, wh what are your suggestions for that? Yeah. So, um, if you are concerned and by the way, uh, not enough traditional veterinarians have heard about this. I have heard some people, uh, telling me that their traditional veterinarians have said to them, yeah, there might be a problem. So they're listening up a little bit. Um, and, you know, to take a stance of, yeah, there might be a problem, that's a great stance. Yep. Be you know, it's like, yeah, there might be, we don't know. May maybe it was the flea chemical you gave your dog. Maybe it was the vaccines that they had. Maybe it was something that was sprayed in your yard. Maybe they ate toxic mushrooms. I don't know. But at least be open enough to say, yeah, it might be related to food. I don't know. So, you know, if you have a sick pet, absolutely get them seen sooner rather than later. Because some of these are going down the tubes very fast. So it starts with diarrhea or soft stools and not wanting to eat, which progresses to liquid diarrhea, which progresses to bloody diarrhea, dehydration, and death. Um, 
But we can also see other things like, you know, melamine, vitamin D, those were kidney failure cases, which the first symptoms of kidney failure can be vomiting and diarrhea. So it could be anything. So if you have a sick pet, save the food sample, take them in and get them seen, get them treated. That is your first priority. Um, and whatever you're feeding, I don't care if you are feeding the most expensive, high-end food in the world, maybe say, I don't know if the pet food, you know, because we've had really high-end companies with really high-end foods that have also had issues occasionally. Mm -hmm. So if there's any question at all, just consider changing the food. It can be for a short period of time, but this, this buys you time to say, could it have been the food or is it something else going on? Because you know what? If you change the food and they miraculously don't have the itching, vomiting, diarrhea, bloating, gas, you know, blood coming out of wherever, um, if you change the food and all that goes away, then you can go, hmm, maybe the food was an issue and great, I solved the problem. It was a quick and easy fix. Yeah. So, um, you know, that is my, my best recommendation. I am not saying you have to, you know, run out and change what you're doing right now. I'm saying when you buy that new box, bag, can, whatever, be very vigilant. And if there is a problem, change, just change. This is, this is such a simple, simple solution. Yeah. You know, I don't care whether we, I, you know, I don't need a class action lawsuit. I don't, I don't need to blow things up. I need, I need people to, to just pay attention and consider what might be causing their pet's problems. Right. Could it be that new flea and tick chemical that you added recently? Could it be that new injection that you started getting for arthritis? Could it be that, you know, heartworm injection or pill? Could it be the food? Could it be something I've changed in the, how I clean my house? But look critically, what has changed and what can you change away from that. Yeah. I think that's a really good, a good way to look at it. And without singling out any brand, because as you said, this could happen with any brand, any, any product, any brand. I mean, yeah. we had, I have great slides on, I probably should have given them to you, uh, on all the different things that we've had recalls for in pet food. Mm. So too much thyroid hormone from thyroid gland being included, um, salmonella, listeria, uh, E. coli, aflatoxins, which are mold toxins, mold in general in food, mold that you can see, um, pentobarbital, we have had uh, recalls on that, and the vitamin D toxicity, low vitamin B1 or thiamine, uh, low taurine. So there, there are so many reasons why pet foods can be recalled, and it's not targeting one company. Any company can have a recall. Any company can have a problem. And this may be something like the vitamin D problem where we will, in the end, find that this spans many companies because there may be an ingredient from a supplier that is being used by many companies. Well, so, and, and that brings me back to your point before. You were talking about uh, foods with synthetics in them, like these vitamin premixes. And I was hoping you could talk a little bit more about why that can spread so quickly, because like with these ultra processed foods, any brand, this is not brand specific. When you look at the last half of the ingredients, you're going to see a bunch of words, chemicals. numbers, typically chemicals, <laughs> right? These synthetic <laughs> vitamins. And uh, as you just alluded to, these can all, many, many times these can have the same manufacturer. So that there could be one manufacturer for this copper synthetic that goes to multiple different brands, like white labeling almost. And if there's one human error, you know, they put a little too much, a little too little, a little too less, um, that could cause horrible issues. And that's why this right. can become an issue so quickly, so widespread. Is that right. a good way to explain it? Absolutely. And the other thing that we see is co-packing. So one mm -hmm. major plant may uh, make formulations for many different pet food companies. They're all made in the same plant. Okay. So if we have contamination of the machinery uh, from the ingredients from one food, it can spread across brands as well, um, which is one of the reasons why I really like pet food companies that have their own facility where there aren't multiple brands being made in the, in the same facility. Um, 
just because I, you know, that it's clean and you know what's there and you know you only have one company to deal with. But when we have those vitamin mineral premixes, um, you know, but it could be any ingredient. It doesn't have to be the vitamin mineral premix. Uh, we know that over 60% of the corn in this country has mold every year during harvest and depends depending on how rainy the years and you can look this up it's listed on the agricultural websites you can find out what percentage of each of the different grains and legumes in our country is contaminated with mold each year but corn usually is about 60 percent so the problem with molds is they bring in these huge tractor trailer loads of corn or rice or wheat or soy whatever they're using peas whatever they're using and they'll test a very small sample out of the tractor trailer load to see how high the mold is. Well, guess where the moldy stuff's hidden? It's either on the bottom or in the middle. Uh, but they'll test a very small amount. And then usually it will actually get sprayed with something to kill the molds. The problem is when the mold dies, it releases a toxin. And the mycotoxins, the mold toxins, are actually what are toxic to our pets. They cause liver failure. So many, many times when we have these animals with these chronically elevated liver enzymes and we just can't get them down, maybe, just maybe, there's mold toxins in the pet food. So, you know, I, that's one of those things I, I actually didn't look recently, but that's one of those things that I actually like looking at every year to see what's the percentage of mold toxins in our grain supply. I mean, this is a problem for us. It's not, it's not just yeah. for our animals. This is a problem for us. Like what percentage of food has molds in it and therefore mold toxins, which can be deadly. So, you know, there, there's just, I, believe me, the human food supply is no better. <laughs> yeah, that's, I was going to say, it's it's a problem in both worlds, which is, it is a problem. scary. And, and we don't share this to overwhelm. I know some people are like, oh gosh, like this is a lot to take in. I think, again, summary is just awareness. Keep an eye on your pet. There's clinical signs or symptoms. Um, and the reason I say clinical signs, Dr. Judy has had one person tell me that dogs don't have symptoms. You have to call it clinical signs. I don't know if that's right, but I've stuck with that. I know I get, I get picked on a lot. Um, take, okay. We'll go with that. that. Yeah. Take me to that. And then I did, I put a screenshot here. Um, I compiled kind of what to do if you think your pet has been sick from pre or any food. And I pulled this from truthaboutpetfood.com, Dr. Judy's feedback, the Saving Pets One at a Time Facebook page, and Dr. Fox, which is basically what Dr. Judy said before. I'll, I'll link it below, just at my website, rachelfuzero.com. But basically, the recommendations, as you said, are to keep the sample in the freezer um, and the original bag. And the, probably one of the more important things I would I would think is that we need to report it to the FDA and report it to Prina. So I have direct links right, right away. Absolutely. If the brand asks you to send a sample, sure. I, th I think is kind of what the current recommendation is, but always keep some for yourself. Um, don't send all of it. Yeah. Um, document any conversation you're having with them, who you're talking to. And then again, um, if you are, uh, if you are, what was going to say, Oh, if they are offering to pay your vet bills, like I'm not going to, I'm not a lawyer. I'm not a veterinarian. So I'm not going to tell you what you should or shouldn't do. Just be aware that as Dr. Judy said, you, you may be giving up rights to talk about this in the future. And maybe that's the place you're at. There's no judgment. Um, but just be aware of that because they are right now, we have multiple consumers that have reported in that Facebook group that say that they're just paying vet bills kind of left and right. So, um, you know, maybe that's a blessing in disguise for some of you, but it does make it difficult if you're not able to talk about it in the future. Um, yeah. And one more thing I'll say about yeah. uh, lab testing, if you do want to send food in. Uh, so we had researched um, on Friday where we could send food samples and we got quotes on different testing. So you basically it's piecemeal. So if you want to test for bacteria, that's one price. If you want to test for mold toxins, that's another price. If you want to test for pentobarbital, that's another price. Melamine, another price. And when you add it all up, that's where it gets expensive. Um, so we're hoping that we can at least get, you know, heavy metals we're including. So, uh, you know, we're hoping that maybe between four samples, we'll see a trend. And so we can direct people, you know, maybe you Which don't have to do do the full testing, maybe you need to test this particular thing because that was across the board an, an issue. But when we went to send the food, uh, 
we asked the lab, oh, the lab asked us what company's food we were testing. And they said, oh, we can't do that. That's a conflict of interest. So be very careful where it is being sent because you may be <laughs> sending it where you're not going to get. Wow. Okay. I didn't know that. So, but yeah. you did there find a place. A conflict of interest. So yeah, we, um, Gwen did some work and we, we have okay. a lab with no conflict of interest that we are able to actually, the samples already went out. Um, so, uh, you know, I would say watch, you know, on Rachel's posts on truthaboutpetfood.com on save saving pets one at a time uh the links will be there for labs that you can use but i would say for right now if you are suspicious with your own pet and their food just keep that sample put it in the freezer wait until we start getting some results um the other thing that we are, you know that is generally needed for these is um pet toxicology reports. And again, until we have a better idea what we're looking for, we just don't know. Um, and autopsies on pets that have died, un unfortunately. And again, that is another very expensive proposition. Um, generally, an autopsy, I'm going to say, is going to run around $1,500. And again, they may or may not be able to link you know, specific things. Uh, they may be able to say, yes, this pet died of necrosis of the kidneys, which means the kidneys died, or this pet died of overwhelming hemorrhagic gastroenteritis. But they, you know, just because we have a name for the diagnosis does not mean we have a correlation with the causation. <laughs> so that, I was going to say, that's what we're going to find, you know, yeah. that we can link that cause. Yeah. But again, um, you know, once, once we have some testing and uh, not, not to, to step even deeper into this hornet's nest, but I saw another brand of pet food that somebody brought up today with a pet with very similar symptoms to everything else that we're seeing uh, and made by a different company. And so when we start seeing things like that, that gets us more to, okay, is there something more in the supply chain like there was with the vitamin mineral premix and the melamine in the premix? So, um, you know, we might start seeing other things that pop up and it may not be a one company problem. Again, it could be like the vitamin D, the melamine, the, you know, it, it could be a bigger issue than what we know of right now. Mm. So, um, you know, one of the things you're, you're going to keep hearing is correlation is not causation. That is true, but you have to start looking somewhere. And so, and the way you do that is you start collecting data and you start showing people the trend. And, um, this is not just me reporting this. This is not just Rachel reporting this. Anyone who questions what we are reporting, please go to Chewy.com, read the reviews on different products since about the 1st of December. If you go back to even June or May, you'll see some problems. But I mean, so many one-star reviews, and they all have very, very common threads. My pet backed away from the food and wouldn't eat it. My pet developed diarrhea immediately after eating this. My pet developed bloody vomiting and diarrhea. Um, and so there is a major trend. It's on Chewy and on Amazon. So it is not just me making up stuff. It's not just these anecdotal reports on this one Facebook group. It's across the board on multiple sites and i i don't i probably uh walmart.com probably has because I, they sell the same products so they may have reviews i didn't even go look on their website but anywhere that sells a lot of pet food um go look at their reviews yeah. and you know again if you haven't had a problem great no problem we're just raising a red flag and saying be vigilant that's all. Yeah, because we're, we're worst case, best case scenario is comes out, there's nothing, although it's really hard because there's so many of these reports, but best case scenario, everybody's good. We're all good, healthy, happy. Wow. That is the goal. Dr. Judy and I have nothing. I, I get a lot of, well, you're just fear mongering Rachel just to get views or something. I'm like, these are not the, go read my comments. These are not the views that I want. Like I, I Dr. Judy will tell you we're, we're in a group and I told everybody I want to delete all the content because it's the negative negativity and, and the hate is, is really strong. And this is really difficult. But like Dr. G said, 
and I look up to her quite a bit is I can't stay quiet. I mean, I'm seeing these firsthand. I'm getting the DMs from pet parents. I have several, I should have screenshotted and cut their names out, but I didn't want to take any risk saying, Rachel, this is what happened to my pet. I had to sign a non-disclosure. I had to take the money from the vet, but thank you for what you're doing. I wish I could share, but I needed the money, like several of those. And so I, I, I can't stay, I can't stay quiet, um, on this. And so what would you say, Dr. Judy, people, I love, I love this one. They're like, well, Purina is such a popular food. So of course there's at any given time, there's going to be tons of pets that are sick and have nothing to do with it. What is your thought on that? Your response on that? Oh, it's true. I mean, I'm getting records and you know, like I, I got one the other day and I was like, you know, I, I only got one set of records from one hospital admission. Um, but the problem looked like it was very chronic. Mm. And I said, I need at least a year's worth of records for a case like this. I need, uh, I need a lot more information and there needs to be a lot more testing. And again, um, so if you have a pet that has chronic kidney failure, could it be the diet? Absolutely. That's what we saw with vitamin D and melamine. Could it be Lyme disease? Could be, could it be another tick-borne disease? It could. Have you done a workup on your pet? Have you tested and ruled out other things? And, and, you know, a lot of times we get to the diagnosis by excluding anything else that could have caused it. So when I see records where I'm like, uh, there could have been a million other things. Um, somebody else sent me some records. The dog was on ProHeart. The dog was on Brevecto. Another dog in the household was on Semperica Trio. And they were on the same food. And I'm like, is this being caused by the food? I don't know. There's, there's a lot of variables here. What we need to do, how about if we just change the diet for the next few weeks and see if they get better? And if this horrible diarrhea problem goes away, then we can say, yeah, it's probably, you know, there's a better chance. Maybe we should test some food. Um, but just remember that the more junk, you know, chemicals, drugs, vaccines, the more junk you throw at your pets, the harder time they have dealing with things. And so it could, and that, this is where, this is why it takes so long to get a recall because we have to get thousands of records Chewy is now telling people they heard a recall is coming soon. That's that's yeah. interesting. That's what, yeah, I actually, have. Chewy is now telling people uh, to, they used to say if you couldn't use the food to donate it. They're not saying And that. then they went to throw it away. Um, then the, there was some people who said they were told to send it back. So I don't know where we are with that now, um, but who knows? Yeah, they um there's somebody who shared their Amazon, I think it was an Amazon chat and they um I mean, and who know, like these people may not know, but in the chat it said uh we hear a recalls coming soon, but that could just be them seeing our content. <laughs> so, exactly. so who knows? I've, had, I've had so many people that have posted, I I checked online, there's no recall. I asked my vet, there's no recall. No, there isn't. There isn't. We need so much more information before a recall can be made. Somebody's got to do a lot of food testing uh, before a recall can be made. That that that's just the way this works, guys. You know, yeah. it's part politics, it's part money, it's part time, it's part trend. Uh, there's just so much that goes into a recall happening. Uh, we've had hundreds, again, not to change the subject, but we've had hundreds of thousands of adverse events to the Isox, Azulene, Flea, and Tick chemicals. No recalls, no changes, no stop selling. It's out there. So it takes, like, you literally have to move mountains to get anything done. And on that note, for anybody watching saying, oh, what are your thoughts on flea and tick or vaccines? We're not going to talk about it here. I will have those videos linked in the description. Um, so if you're wondering what Dr. Judy's takes on those are, that will be linked below. I think that, oh, go ahead. Just guess. <laughs> yeah, I know. You can guess what it is. But if you want to really hear her thoughts, like really know what, how she feels about it, I'll link those down below for you. So let's talk about the Purina statement because I, I do want to address that they, um, let me pull it up here. I know you have it in front of you. 
Um, they, they posted this uh, a few days ago. And I'll just read through it really quick. Please be aware of online rumors claiming there are issues with Purina products. These are false and maybe creating unnecessary stress for pet parents. There are no health or safety issues with any of our products, and they continue to be fed with confidence. Then they talk a lot about their quality and assurance, which I'm not going to read through in detail, but it's on the screen. And I will link it below because, again, I want to give um, everybody, you know, give due diligence. And I love how they say this. Oh, I don't know how to minimize your thing. But if you read something online that concerns you, you can reach out to Prina, which I recommend it's report to Prina any issues you potentially have. And I love how they say some well-intentioned pet parents who are genuinely concerned or trying to be helpful are oh shoot um, oh, or sorry, they're I just it. trying to be chaos and distrust distrust of certain brands as an opportunity to sell their own products. Um, which Dr. Judy and I, neither of us have a pet food brand, so I don't know how that would work. Either way, please know that there's if there's a confirmed issue, if there is a confirmed issue, Perina will let you know. So they did they did release that statement. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I'm not trying to create chaos and distrust. I'm trying to make sure that we don't have animals dying if there is a problem going on. Again, this is how an investigation starts. Um, and, you know, I just put myself in the middle of the road and I'm letting 400 trucks run over me on a daily basis. It's fine. Uh, I'm not trying to create chaos. Uh, yeah, no, no need. I mean, I know my hair looks like I stuck my finger in an electric socket today, but it's been that kind of day. Um, you know, and somebody accused me and said, you just want to make a lot of money off of suing Purina. Well, what would I sue them for? And I won't be part of a class action lawsuit if there ever is one, just like I didn't have to be part of the Avengers lawsuit or the Hills lawsuit because I don't feed those brands. Yeah. I, I never, well, I can't say I never have. I never will because now I know better. Yeah. I've known better for 20 years. So the, the thing is, <laughs> I, I'm spending money on this project. <laughs> I am not making a dime. Yeah. I have I have no skin in this game, folks. The only skin I have in this game is saving pets. And you know what? I I can't not do that. I can't I can't not speak up when I see a potential problem. I can't I can't go back and climb in my box <laughs> that you'd all like me to sit quietly in. It no, does. I want you free. Set you free. <laughs> <laughs> As my daughter says, Judy is just going to do Judy. And, I, you know, I there, there's no other way for me to live my life. Yeah. I live my life with integrity and the best intentions. And if I think that a pet food company, a pharmaceutical company, a group of veterinarians, um, anybody is doing something to harm animals, I'm going to speak up. And you know what? I would be the same way about a pharmaceutical company or a food company harming people, children, adults. It's just like, why Somebody would we has, not? Why, yeah. Why, why would exactly. we not speak up? Why would we not Somebody speak up? Be that person who is willing to lay it all on the line and say, hey, we might have an issue here. Yeah. You know, yeah. I just, it's like. And it, it's hard. I mean, and I, I just want to tell people when they're like, oh, you just want this for views or whatever I'm trying to gain out of this. And I, I said this before, I'll say it again. Go look at my comment section. Like, Th these are not the views or the people that I'm trying to reach with my content. And truth nope. be told, if I was in this for the money, and I know if Dr. Judy was in this for the money, we would not be going down the path that we're going down. We would be working for big conglomerate pet food. If that's what we wanted, um, that's what we would be working for. If, if it was just for money and gain and fame or whatever. Like, I, I, I wish people understood um, how difficult kind of going this alternative route is from non-mainstream, but it's so worth it. There's nothing else. Like this is what we live, live and breathe. So, and you've been doing it for so long. And I give props to you because your profession as a veterinarian, majority of them are pushing back and that's got to be so difficult. I'm just this, you know, pet parent. So it's easier for me to just kind of like, well, this is what I'm learning from experts, but you are the expert and that's, that's got to be tough. So thank you for, for, for speaking, you know, and being so brave with that. Well, I, I, I wish I was braver because I was saying before we went live, I was just at the veterinary office with my dog who needed oh, an yeah. x-ray 
And the client before me was walking out with a bag of a prescription Purina pet food. And I was just like, oh, geez, you know, but it's, yeah. that wasn't my place to, to, you know, I have my platform where I can do that. That wasn't my place to say something. And right before that, my husband and I went to the grocery store and the person in front of us in line had absolutely the worst pet food products and treats on the, and I took a picture of it slyly and sent it to my daughter with the emoji. And then the person in line behind us had something even worse for their pets on the little conveyor. And I, and I took another picture and sent it to Gwen and I said, you know what? You know how when you get older and you're bored at home and you're like, I'm just going to go get a job so that I, you know, can talk to people and see people. I'm like, I can't even, I can't get a job in the grocery store because I would be pulling things off the belt and going, you can't feed that. You can't, you can't buy that. That's really horrible for your kids. You can't buy that stuff. <laughs> no, that would be a video I would subscribe to. <laughs> that would be a rant. That would be, that would go viral. And I also want, want to reiterate this too, is like the amount of free content that you give out for free, you are a professional and you are taking your knowledge and expertise of 30 plus years and sharing it with us for free every single week, daily. I don't think people realize like how, how, how often can you talk to your personal veterinarian for free? I, I want to ask people that, but they can log in and watch podcasts and blogs and videos and everything and, you know, get your book. I mean, it's just so much stuff you're giving out. And I just, that's so valuable. And I wish people would like understand like how selfless that is in so many ways. Um, okay. So we're getting close to time. I do want to spend just a second because I already know the answer, but people are going to be saying, actually, I actually want to go back to what you said at the very beginning is that most pet foods and pretty much all kibbles are feed grade. And you said something that I try to reiterate a lot. That's so powerful, but you actually said something I didn't realize. So I, if I'm correct, you said that feed grade foods are all rendered and because they're rendered, they, and part of that process means that they pretty much are guaranteed to have euthanasia medicine, at least in small amounts in feed, pretty much all feed grade fruit. Yeah. I didn't make that statement. That was the head of the rendering company that said that. The, okay. The, the, so, biggest, the biggest rendering group in the country. Yeah. And, that. and that's something I talk a lot about in terms of like feed grade versus human grade. Cause I, this is kind of a segue into your preferred type of pet food, which is going to be human grade, fresher pet food. I'll, I'll let you talk to that, but I want to reiterate like back to the point earlier, we were saying that we're not like anti any brands. I've, I'll say this and cause I've said it in content before, like I personally wouldn't feed my dog Perina right now. Um, and a big reason is the sourcing, the lack of understanding of what that sourcing is. And the fact that it's a feed grade food, feed grade is rendered ultra processed, but can also include as you, as well, as this, the head of the rendering plant alluded to and explained that it can include euthanized chemicals, medicines, animals, 4D animals, dead, dying, disease down. And so these are reasons that I try to stay away from these ultra processed kibbles. I'm not anti kibble, but I try to um, push in, push pet parents into the category of fresher human grade foods. What is your stance on um, pet food and what your preference is? Well, you know, I didn't know the difference between human grade and feed grade until I started going to AFCO meetings and I met Susan Thixton and I really started studying pet food. And there's a huge difference. So feed grade pet food is basically regulated the same as livestock feed. Um, and I mean, that's, a, that's another whole conversation, but our livestock is being fed grocery store waste in the plastic containers, ground up in the plastic bags. That's, that's where it all goes. Where do you think all the, um, the the outdated uh, dairy products and the outdated bakery products in the grocery store go, they go to feed livestock, but they don't take them out of the plastic containers and the bags. It's all just ground up. So that that's another whole thing. But, you know, that's sort of the, the mindset and the thinking when you're talking about feed grade. Uh, so what is allowed to go into pet food that is feed grade is very different from what you 
uh, might see on the pictures on the bag. So a bag of pet food might have a picture of a steak and fresh carrots and fresh spinach and broccoli and blueberries. And you think, wow, that's what's in that food. Except it's not. It is not human grade. A lot of it is condemned food from the human food industry. So it is the waste products. It's the spent products from like brewing and, uh, you know, just processing food. There's always a lot of leftover waste pieces of the grain, the fiber, the hulls, just all that waste. And so it's it goes into pet food. And what the pushback that we get from the pet food industry is, well, would you rather all of that went into a landfill? What a waste that would be. Well, right. my pet is not a landfill right. and I don't want my pet to be treated like a landfill. I think there are a lot of other uses that we could find for those waste ingredients. Maybe they could go into fertilizer. Maybe they could go into, um, you know, maybe we can figure out some way to mix it into something that we can use for roadways and construction. I don't know. All I know is I don't want my dogs and cats eating waste. I don't want them eating condemned meats. I don't want them eating condemned food. I don't want them eating food with chemicals and toxins in it. I want them eating something that I would eat. So the foods that I feed my pets, I would have no problem taking a spoonful and eating it. No problem at all. I might cook it for me. They're all raw fed. <laughs> I might cook it for me, but I actually, steak tartare is one of my favorite things and I love sushi. So I don't even know that I would have to cook it. Um, so... But that's the quality I look for. And when I look for supplements and things to treat my pets, it needs to be the same quality that I would use for myself. Um, when I look at supplements, everything needs to be human grade. Everything needs to be the best possible quality that I can get because I want my pets to be healthy. So right now, my oldest dog will be 17 in a few months. He's got heart disease. He's got neurologic problems. He's got bladder cancer that he's had for over a year. You would never know it. He races around the house. He eats like a champ. He plays with the puppies. He's a nutcase. And he's almost 17. Why is that? And by the way, his cancer is not being treated with chemo and radiation and all kinds of horrible things. It's being controlled with natural therapies. Does that work for 100% of cases? No, but food is the foundation of life. And if you want to get your pets, if you want your dogs to live in their 20s and your cats to live into their 30s, you are going to have to give them a good foundation. And that is very difficult to do with feed grade and with chemical vitamin mineral premixes thrown in there and with, you know, the problems that we see. And one of the big complaints that I'm seeing from people is, my pet has pancreatitis, and this is the only diet that has worked for them. Well, we've got a lot of information about pancreatitis on our website. I would encourage people to check. It's free information. Check out the free information on pancreatitis. And when you see what the causes and underlying problems can be, maybe you'll look at it a little bit differently. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I know that you have a list of your favorite dog food brands on your website, drjudymorgan.com. You even have courses that um, teach people how to make their own dog food. So I know a lot of people right now are like, I want to make my own dog, for, dog food. Um, you can check that out. It'll all be linked in the description below as well. It's there. Yeah, right now. For, for people who are like, I'm scared to death to make my own food because I'll screw it up. I won't get it right. There won't be enough vitamins and minerals. Well, yeah, there are things that you need to do. A good, great starting place is what we call a hybrid meal. Get one of the, the premixes from one of the good companies. So I'll name a couple. We've got Dr. Harvey's. We've got uh, The Honest Kitchen. Uh, do you have any other favorite base mixes that you like? I'm using Raw Vibrance Dr. Harvey right now with my dog. Okay. So yeah. th those are base mixes, which basically you add meat and oil. So simple to do. And then you know where the ingredients are coming from, that there are companies, and uh, a lot of these base mixes are all organic veggies. So if you've got an organic base mix, and then you control the expense and quality of the meat. So if you can go get meat that's on sale, if, if the meat is 
of questionable quality, then gently cook it. Um, but, you know, if it's a, a high quality that you would feed your own family, it's up to you whether it's raw or cooked. I'm not against cooking food. I have no problem with that for our pets. Um, even though mine are raw fed, that's my choice. Uh, but for those who are afraid, getting a premix is is just an easy first step if you want to i when i started with my dogs getting them off of big pet food brands um, and i went to raw i ordered pre-made raw because i didn't know how to balance a meal so i ordered pre-made i said well, that's a little pricey on the shipping and all that stuff although we have so many more companies available now the pricing has actually come down a lot um so that's how I got started. And then I wanted to start making some of my own meals. And I look back at some of my recipes from when I first started. And I'm like, man, I was really far off from it being balanced. But you know what? My animals still did well. Um, and now I know how to balance them. And that's great. But a great starting point is these premixes where just buy some meat and some oil. And it's, it's you know, the, the instructions are right there. It's simple to do. Um, Freeze-dried foods or uh, air-dried foods, the baked foods. Like if you have to feed a kibble, look for a baked kibble instead of an extruded kibble. Because if it's a dried or baked product, it doesn't go through that really high heat processing. It doesn't get destroyed. And the other thing that I would say is look for foods if at all possible, that don't have that vitamin mineral premix added into them. I like to get all of the nutrition that my pets need from whole foods because it's really hard to have a toxicity of a vitamin or mineral from whole foods. That's why people don't die of toxicities from vitamins and minerals from eating whole foods. <laughs> so, so we see the same thing with our pets. You can have deficiencies, and that's why it is important um, to make sure that you're getting the calcium and the vitamin D and all those things that, that we talk about. And so there's a lot of information I, you know, that is readily available out there. There's a lot of free recipes. Uh, make sure you're getting your recipes from a reputable source. Unfortunately, in this group, the Saving Pets one at a time, a lot of people have been posting their homemade recipes and they fall really short of uh, being um, nutritionally complete. So uh, be really careful there. Make sure. And there are tons of free recipes on my website and then tons of recipes in my books. Yep. And we actually have one that we did together. I'll put it, um, link it down below where we have, it's a completely free guide talking about starting raw dog food. And there is a um, recipe. And then Dr. Judy and I last year made a um, meal topper starter guide. So the other option is if financially or just your lifestyle, you, you need to feed a kibble. Um, I understand that's where a lot of people are. Even adding just a little bit of fresh food can be highly beneficial and then eventually eventually, will wean you off. Um, but that guide is completely free. I'll link it down below. Um, but yeah, like I said, there's a lot of great resources, drjudymorgan.com, rachelfuzero.com. And we're really just here to help you make the best decisions for your pet that you feel confident about. I think, Dr. Judy, I'll end on one of the things that breaks my heart is most of my, I'll say a lot of my DMs and comments are people saying, this is what I'm feeding. The brand doesn't matter. This is what I'm feeding. And I'm not sure if it's the best food. And I just want to get to a place where somebody can pour or scoop or serve their dog, their meal or their cat and feel good about it and know what they're feeding and understand it. Not necessarily the nitty gritty, but general understanding of what they're giving their pet. And unfortunately, I don't think that's the case for majority. So that's what I know we're both here out trying to empower pet parents to do. With that said, I think that's all of it. Do you have any other last final points? Because I think this is going to be a big one. So <laughs> your face is going to be everywhere after this. So anything else you want to leave us with? Apparently my face has been everywhere recently. <laughs> yes, it has. It has. Uh, yeah. Uh, you know, it's just, all I can say is all we want to do is raise awareness. All we want to do is have people pay attention. And like, I remember when I never had a cat until after I was an adult. And at, at the time I fed kibble, you know, I didn't know any better. And my cat used to, puke all the time. And I can't tell you, even my first 10 years as a veterinarian, puking cats was just normal. Like, oh, well, your cats always vomit hairballs. Well, yeah, cats just vomit a lot. That's normal. It's normal to come down your stairs and step into a pile of cat vomit every morning in your bare feet. Mm -hmm. You know what? 
I got nine cats right now. I never have vomiting cats. Since I have started feeding my animals the way they need to be fed with whole food, real food, human grade ingredients, there's no vomiting. Like that is not normal folks. And you know, for your dog to have random vomiting a couple times a month, not normal. To have soft stools, diarrhea, blood in the stool, not normal. Like I, 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 we've all just been so ingrained into, well, that's just what they do. You know what? If my kid had bloody stools two or three times a month, yeah, this would not be. I think I'd be. I think I'd be at the doctor's office. And on like, that I note, I want to change something. Yeah, I want to tell pet parents. On that note, if your veterinarian is telling you something that just doesn't quite feel right, or you're concerned, and your veterinarian saying it's fine, I'm not saying don't trust him or her. But feel free to get a second opinion. Like I've done that. I have a, several veterinarians that I consult and that's okay. Because I think that's the other thing. People come to me and they say, well, my veterinarian said it's fine. My dog pukes bile every other day, every other day or my cat has hair balls, but I don't feel like it's right. I'm like, okay, that's how you feel. Get a second opinion, you know, if you can. I know that's tough. But And an antacid is not the solution. Oh, Pepsid yeah. is prescribed. Pepsid and metronidazole are prescribed all the time. That's not the solution. That's a drug treating a symptom. No, we want to, or cl treating a clinical sign, whatever we want to cause it. But it's a symptom of something isn't right. So, you know, it's, it's, it's just like human medicine. You take a pill, it has a side effect. So now you take this pill to get rid of that side effect. We, you didn't solve the problem. The problem was the inciting cause. So that's, you know, I see it all the time. I get emails every day. Well, I took my dog in because he has chronic acid reflux and the vet told, told me to give Pepsid and my dog's been on Pepsid for a year and it's still really no better. And man, you got to find the problem. You can't like stop putting band-aids on symptoms. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's, I mean, that's the whole premise of your career, holistic, integrative veterinary medicine, looking at the and cause. And I'm not saying that you never use them. drugs. Yeah. I, you know, I'm a huge fan of drugs when you need them, but there's an awful lot of drugs that we don't need because we haven't solved the cause, the underlying cause. Yes. Yes. I just, last thing I have to say is I find it funny. I can tell that you and I have both definitely you a lot more received backlash over the years. Cause I feel like everything <laughs> we say, we're like, it's not me. We don't mean this, but this is what we mean. Cause I feel like things are always taken out of context and we've learned the hard way to say, here's the specific. It's not this or that. So anyways, okay. That, that I've taken too much of your time. I appreciate you, Dr. Judy. Um, everyone, yeah. please follow her, Dr. Judy Morgan everywhere, YouTube, Facebook, Instagram website. Um, because I know she's going to be sharing a lot of updates. I'll be sharing a lot of updates as well. RachelFusero.com and make sure you follow, subscribe, and please share this video. I think this video will be very important. Um, <laughs> and although maybe I'll ask you not to, cause I'm probably going to um, get the backlash. Yeah, I know. the backlash, but I do think the awareness happy new year. is key. Yeah. Happy, <laughs> happy new year. <laughs> All right, guys, with that, we'll talk to you soon. And thank you so much for being here.